Welcome to everybody in the forum, as well as those who are going to be seeing this at a later date. The webinar today is called Taking a Selfie, Making Teachers Thinking Visible. So the idea behind this, while there has been a lot written about making students thinking visible, and in fact, the visual tools that I'll be sharing with you this afternoon have traditionally been used with children, with younger people, or with people who are learning about something, some concept or topic. I thought that I would look at the tools in a slightly different way. So the focus here is on teachers and on teachers' metacognition, teachers being able to think about their own thinking. So just as cameras allow selfies, so they show you a selfie of what you look like outside. These visual tools allow selfies of what your thinking looks like. So they give you a picture of your thoughts, of your how you are thinking about something. The webinar will explore the potential of visual tools to take selfies of your thinking, in particular, your thinking about instructional planning. Of course, it can't be exhaustive, given the time limitations of the webinar and the depth to which this topic could be examined. You can take this topic and run with it for miles and miles. Planning for instruction. This is one of the most, if not the most, critical phase of instruction. Because good planning undergirds good teaching. Good planning may not translate into good teaching sometimes, but at least if the teacher knows where he or she is going, then when the plans go awry, they know that they, they can bring things back to where they intended to go. Or they can incorporate the tangents that students often take you on because they know how to bring those that thinking back to their learning goals. Good planning is creative problem solving. The teacher thinks critically about the best way to provide learning experiences to facilitate learning outcomes that the teacher wants their students to achieve. So when you take part in this planning exercise. I hope you feel like me that it is a wonderful creative thing. It's as if you're, you're creating a sculpture or a painting. Let me set the context for the webinar. So I'm using some headings that you can see. Planning, how, planning who, and planning what. Under planning how, just so that we are on the same page, as you know, there are many different models for planning instruction. So we are going to take planning as meaning Assessing your students' needs. Stating your learning outcomes, including your technology learning outcomes. Planning learning experiences for your students that will facilitate the achievement of the learning outcomes that you specified. And including in those experiences the resources you will need, as well as the strategies, both teacher-centered and learner-centered, that you will be using to 
provide these learning experiences for your learners. And of course, we have planning assessment experiences. Now, I've listed these sort of pieces of planning one under the other, so it looks as if they're linear. But of course, they are not. There is an interplay among all of these pieces. Usually, you begin with assessing your students' needs. But along the way, you will find that those needs will change, even in a single lesson. And so you will need to revisit that, as well as, therefore, planning learning experiences. In the same way, I like to embed assessment experiences in my activities. And so assessment and learning, learning activities for me, often go hand in hand rather than as a separate component of a particular lesson. Now, at the end of a unit, I might take assessment out because perhaps I want to do a summative assessment of the entire unit. But usually, I would embed formative assessment in the learning experiences. Planning who? Who is doing the instructional planning? It could be the individual teacher, or it could be groups of teachers. It is fairly common for teachers at the same year level to plan together. In this way, for example, integrated planning happens. It is also uh, pretty common for teachers in the same content area to plan together. So for example, all the math teachers or all the language arts teachers would plan together. What would you be planning? What is the unit of planning? Well, it could be a single lesson or it could be a sequence of lessons for example, a unit of instruction. So we're talking about planning for classroom implementation. What are we planning with? Today's webinar looks at planning using visual tools. The tools that I will be looking at are the Freyer diagram, the KWL chart. What do I, sorry, what do I know? What do I want to know? What, what have I learned? Mind map and the concept map. None of these tools is meant to do all of your planning. I am going to be showing you aspects of planning that I think these tools are useful for. And of course, the point of this webinar, why use visual tools? Well, the answer right now is to make teachers thinking visible so that teachers have a concrete visual, a picture, just like in the old days when you had a paper photograph, a concrete visual image with which to examine their thinking about planning. I'm going to move now into the tools. So the first tool is called a Freyer diagram. Freyer diagrams are extremely useful tools. I have used them in a number of ways. The usual way of using them is as a pre-assessment as an assessment of the learner's prior knowledge about something. And that something goes in the middle of the diagram where it says central concept. What is interesting about the Freyer, as you can see, it has the four different quadrants. The quadrants that say non-characteristics and non-examples are usually 
the more difficult ones for students to complete. Because whereas they know what the thing is, it is often quite difficult for them to say what the thing is not in particular concepts. As you can see at the bottom of this slide, the Freyer diagram is credited to Dorothy Freyer, 1969, and it was initially um, created by Ms. Freyer as a tool for students to think about vocabulary. And so a particular vocabulary concept would have been put in the center of the Freyer diagram and students would have been asked to fill in the four quadrants. And this would normally happen before the teaching of a lesson. And then the teacher could reprise the Freyer diagram and take a look at the evolution of the student's thinking or the learner's thinking. Today, I want to look at this in a slightly different way. What do you think is effective planning for instruction? How do you plan instruction that promotes deep learning? So at the center of my Freya diagram, that is the question or the essential idea that I would put. How do I do instructional planning that promotes deep student understanding? And here is where we begin to have this Freyer diagram reflect our own thinking. So our own thinking as we plan for instruction. What are some of the essential characteristics of instruction that promotes deep student understanding? Now these ideas would have been coming from you, coming from the person who is using the Freyer diagram. So I filled in under essential characteristics, instruction that identifies essential concepts, principles, or big ideas. That is planning that does that. Planning that is learner-centered, that is informed by students' readiness, interests, and learning preferences. Now remember, this is a picture of what you think. And so the Freyer diagram, this particular diagram, only reflects your beliefs. So there are no right answers here. There's just what you think. Non-essential characteristics, and like the students, this gave me gave me um, pause to think myself. And so this stimulated my own critical examination of instructional planning that promotes deep understanding. So non-essential characteristics, sequential, uh, neither here nor there. Could be sequential, could not be. Individually planned by myself or planned in a group, doesn't really matter. Planning a single lesson or a sequence of lessons, I'm still going to be aiming for deep understanding. Examples. Examples of instructional planning that I've, I've used that promote deep student understanding include concept-based planning, and wherever I've indicated a reference, I have put that reference at the end of the, the seminar. So concept-based planning using Erickson's work, backwards design using Wiggins and McTeague's work, and differentiated instruction using Tomlinson's work. I've also explored problem-based planning project-based planning, and integrated planning. I should say that all of these types of designs 
are pretty challenging. Non-examples. We all know the examples of bad planning. So I walk into my classroom and I open my textbook and today we are doing this topic according to how it's written in the textbook and here are the questions at the end that I would like you to answer. That is a most definite non-example of planning for deep student understanding. It's an example of not planning. Another non-example is planning that is content heavy. That stresses a lot of recall of facts, memorization of procedures, and memorization of definitions. And of course, the one that we're all guilty of, one size fits everybody. I don't have the time to differentiate. Let me just go in there. I know I have a good lesson. I am going to teach it to all the kids. And then I will catch those who don't get it or are having problems. Our second visual tool is the KWL chart. What do I already know? What do I want to know or to learn? What have I learned? I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this tool. It is popularly used, it's used in many schools, but it is usually used for students' self-assessment. The nice thing about this tool is that it follows learning. And so in the beginning, the students assess their prior knowledge. What do I already know? And then also in the beginning, what do I want to know about this topic? What am I interested in? And then finally, at the end of the period of instruction, what have I learned? We're going to look at this tool for teachers. So the KWL chart can take a picture of your thinking as you begin to plan for instruction. So I'll use the same structure. You can use the same structure to examine yourself. Again, here we have a tool that can provide you with a concrete way of capturing your thinking. So again, under this no, you can ask yourself any number of questions. And I've chosen these, and there are a zillion more that I'm sure you can think about. What do I, the teacher, already know about this topic or concept? Am I familiar with the big ideas or the essential understandings that I want my students to achieve? How comfortable am I teaching this topic? What concepts do I struggle with? Sometimes teachers don't teach some concepts because they're not familiar with them, in particular in science. If at the beginning or before instruction you can already pinpoint these topics, then you can go and make yourself more comfortable. You can go and find out what it is that you, you don't already know. You can go and explore these topics. Do I know what technology resources are available to support my teaching? And for all of these, where can I find more information about this topic or concept or idea? What do I want to know about this topic? Me, myself. What is my interest in this topic? And sometimes I'm not interested, but are there things that I've always wondered about? Because chances are your students or your learners are also going to be wondering about the same thing. How can I make this topic come alive for my students? How can I perk their interest in the topic? Learned. When you're using this model with children or with learners, they would ask themselves, what have I learned 
after the period of instruction. But the teacher can ask herself or himself, what assessment strategies do I know? Which ones do I feel comfortable using? What is the balance that I want between traditional and non-traditional assessments? How many assessments am I going to be able to use in the time that I have? Do I know how I'm going to use the results of these assessments to inform my instruction? And is my assessment philosophy in sync with that of the school? The mind map. Again, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with mind maps. Mind maps are wonderful free association tools that pretty much allow you to do a brain dump. So you can put on paper or using software everything that you're thinking about the central idea or topic or whatever it is that's at the center of your mind map. And so you can free associate. Related ideas will come right out of your head. How might you use this to create a picture of your thinking? Notice that at the center of the mind map is the thing that you're planning. So you could be planning a lesson or you could be planning a unit. And again, there, there are models of planning, for example, the Assure model, that um, sort of take you through a sequence of steps. And I'm going to present this visual as a sequence of steps, but in fact, it's not at all sequential. With the mind map, remember, you can free associate and there is, you know, one piece of information doesn't come before the other. So, in thinking about your lesson plan or your unit plan or in any teaching learning situation, you have to think about who your target learners are. What are they interested in? What are their learning preferences, which includes their learning styles, their information processing habits, their multiple intelligences, and so on and so on. Who are these people who are the targets of your instruction? Then you have to look at what, it, what is it that I want to teach these people? Like what is the content? And more than content, what I would encourage you to do is to think about what are the big ideas? What are the core ideas? What are the essential understandings that I would like my students to leave with at the end of either the lesson or the unit at the end of the thing that I am planning. Your content standards will vary according to your country. It also varies according to the different subject-based organizations out there. For example, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, which would be, of course, mathematics and several other uh, organizations, professional organizations, that have defined the content standards in their particular area. There's a National Science Teachers Association, for example, and there is the AAAS organization, for example,
there are these content standards that you can make reference to. Technology standards have been given by ISTE, the International Society for Technology in Edu Education. And in fact, they have defined standards for teachers, for students, for administrators, and so on. So as you reflect on this thing that you're planning, I would encourage you to free associate to the learning outcomes, the big ideas, the essential understandings, the content standards, the benchmarks in the area that you are teaching. What kinds of thinking do I want to promote? Lower order thinking skills or higher order thinking skills? What kind of thinking do I want for my students? That one is pretty clear and I would direct you to a wonderful book that I've made reference to at the end of this presentation called Making Thinking Visible. What sort of strategies am I going to use in my teaching? Which teacher-centered strategies am I going to use? I know sometimes you know there is a push for learner-centered strategies, but in fact, you, the teacher in the classroom, you also manage learning using teacher-centered strategies. Are you going to be using a lecture discussion for your older uh, learners? Are you going to be using a one-on-one -on -one, sit in a circle discussion with your younger learners? And so on and so on. And of course the learner-centered strategies. What learner-centered strategies are you planning to use? Are you going to be using collaborative group work? Are you going to be using think, pair, share? Are you going to be using a jigsaw method? And so on and so on. What resources do I have or can I get, including media and technology? And you will have to actively think about where to source these things and also, of course, what you're in classroom or in instructional setting uh, resources are. Many, many primary school teachers have access to only a single computer. What authentic learning experiences do I want my students to have? Which of course means that I am therefore going to plan them. So authentic. Authentic can have two meanings. There is an authentic learning experience because it is directly aligned with the learning outcomes that you wish to achieve. And there is also authentic in the sense of real world, that a student is presented, for example, with a problem in the real world. And this is the basis, of course, for problem-based learning and sometimes for project-based learning. What assessments am I going to use? And when am I going to use them? And how am I going to use them? And with whom am I going to use them? So after you've finished completing one of these mind maps, and of course it can take uh, you know, a few minutes, a few weeks, a few months. <laughs> after you've finished completing your mind map, you can see the pieces that you need to work on in order to do good planning. 
And of course, mind, this is just the first level of a mind map. Each of the nodes, each of those blue oval boxes, oh, blue, sorry, blue oval shapes, each of those could be further explained and further and further. So you could end up with quite, quite a complicated but very rich mind map. Let us look now at the concept map, a very powerful visual tool. The concept map allows you to take a picture of your thinking about relationships, relationships among concepts. So there is a central concept at the top of the map, and usually the concept map is hierarchical. So at the next level, you would put related concepts that are sort of at the same level of thinking. That is not always easy. The other thing to notice about a concept map is that the arrows have meaning. The arrows on a concept map show the relationship between concepts and among concepts. The idea of the concept map was first introduced by J.D. Novak, who at the time was a professor at Cornell University in the 1960s. Again, I have attached at the end of this presentation a website to an excellent reference on using concept mapping to create visual mental pictures. Also attached to that site is concept mapping software, which I have found very useful with the students that I teach, and in particular, very useful when they're thinking about different ways of planning instruction, whether it's problem-based learning, project-based learning, or integrated thematic learning. This is an example of a concept map that was created by one of the students in my class. And I thank her very much. Her name is Jalisa Seeley. I thank her very much for agreeing to have her work shown here. We were about to start looking at differentiated instruction. And the, the task, the assignment, was to do a reading that I gave to the class and then to create the concept map of your understanding of the reading. And this is what Jalisa produced using the CMAP software. The software is very easy to use and you can register to use the beta version which is free at the moment so i would encourage you to explore it's very easy to use this concept map did not take very long to create the the time was really determined by the thinking time rather than the getting to know how the tool works time as you can see jalisa has produced quite an extensive map notice the relationships that are indicated on the lines. Relationships are usually indicated as verbs, whereas the nodes, so the again, those um, sort of rounded rectangles, those are usually uh, stipulated as nouns. So here I have a picture of what the sense that Jalisa makes of differentiated instruction. And here, Jalisa has a picture of the sense she makes of differentiated instruction. Now, let us look at Karen's picture. 
Karen had the exact same assignment and the exact same time in which to produce her concept map. As you can see, the map looks very different. And as with Jalisa, I thank Karen, Karen Williams, very much for allowing me to share her work with you. Again, notice that the nodes have nouns and the connections are usually verbs. Concept maps also allow you to take a picture of your thinking about the alignment of the pieces of a single lesson. Or you can get more complicated and look at the pieces of a unit of work. And here are sort of the basic pieces that you would plan. Your learning outcomes, based on, so you would state your learning outcomes and based on those, you would try to figure out what learning experiences am I going to provide? What are my assessments? How are all of these things aligned with each other? So those arrows really should be double-headed. So how are all these pieces hanging together? One of the exercises I've done with my students is to have them do this with the curriculum they have to teach. So for example, this is directly from the primary mathematics syllabus, class four, here in Barbados. And it comes out of the national curriculum. And so the national curriculum suggests for uh, this particular uh, topic, which is fractions and decimals, the curriculum suggests those objectives those activities and that assessment. As a teacher, you can use this as a, as a starting place to think about how these pieces are aligned and then yourself, you can go into the concept map and you can add further activities, further assessments and any objectives you think should also be included. Finally, and I think this is one of the very powerful aspects of visual tools, so this is not just concept maps, although that is the diagram I'm showing you. So this is for any visual tool. It's like looking at two photographs of two people. Concept maps or visual tools allow teachers to share their thinking. It allows them to make their thinking visible to other teachers. And therein lies the real power of collaborative planning. So to summarize, Making thinking visible through the use of visual tools encourages you, the teacher, to look critically at your own thinking. It allows you to compare your thinking with that of somebody else's. And so you think again. It allows you to think again. So these tools can foster teacher collaboration around planning for instruction. I encourage you to explore your own ways of using the tools discussed here and any other visual tools to think about your instruction. There are myriad of visual tools out there and you can bring them into your planning process as ways of making your thinking visible both to yourself and to the colleagues that you may plan instruction with. And I would be very happy to hear your ideas. 
a few references that I've found to be very useful. Erickson, concept-based curriculum. McTeague and Wiggins, backwards design. Novak, who is the father of concept maps. Rickard Church and Morrison, making things visible. These folks are associated with uh, Project Zero out of Harvard. Smoldino, Lothar and Russell, introducing instructional technology and media for learning. They have a very good model for integrating media and technology. And Caroline Tomlinson's The Differentiated Classroom. Thank you.